We are partying this Easter weekend with Fresh Life Church. Their hub is in Montana. They got campuses all over the place. Our great friends, Levi and Jenny Lusco, are the pastors. And I know you're trying to clap. No, stop. I, I saw it. Every time Levi comes here to speak, I, don't, I say, we're not introducing a guest. He's family. And we mean that. And, 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 and Fresh Life, every time I'm there and when Levi's introducing me, he says, Sean's not a guest. He's family. And we do mean that. We've always thought of ourselves as like Red Rocks Church and Fresh Life. Like we are family. We've always thought of it that way. And, and what I want you to know is, is sometimes life happens and sometimes things get difficult. And when that happens, family steps up. That's what, that's what family does. Um, Fresh Life, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but because of the circumstances, Levi and Jenny can't tell you this. So I am, as you know, his dad has been battling cancer for the last year. And just yesterday, things took a turn for the worse and they had to suddenly leave town and go be by his side to support him. And of course, the last thing in the world they wanted to do is not be with you on Easter, but this was just more important. And so we talked yesterday and we said, listen, this is what family does. And so now we're doing church together with you as a family. Keep Levi and Jenny and that whole family in your prayers. Red Rocks Church at every location, can you go bananas for Fresh Life Church? We love you, Fresh Life, your family. All right, high five three people and have a seat. For those of you who are just joining us uh, and for Fresh Life Church, uh, we've been in a series called I Am. You guys enjoying that series? Um, this series has been so pivotal for us and is so pivotal because what's going on is, for those of you who don't know, is seven times in the book of John, Jesus says, I am, and then he follows it up with a description of himself. The point of this, the reason it's so important is because it's Jesus saying, I want you to know me. I'm not looking for religious activity. We're not about religious exercises and activities at this church. We want to have an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus himself, and we believe we can. So Jesus says, I want you to get to know me. And he says, I am in seven different things. And then he says this, if you know me, you know the Father. And when we know the Father, it starts to change everything about our life and we start to discover our purpose. And we, when we discover our purpose, we live differently and we go change the world and that's what we want anyways. He says, you know me, you know the Father. I want you to know God so you can find out your purpose. Find out your purpose, you live different and go change the world, amen? So, so that's why this series is so important. It would be like if we just met and I was like, hey, let's get to know each other. And I'm really sorry that you stood outside in the, in the what is that thing called? The, what is that, James? Courtyard, out in the courtyard. It's kind of half built. Out in the courtyard for Easter, I'm really sorry. Let's get to know each other. And I would say, you know, I'll just tell you seven things about me, right? I, I am a Christ follower and I'd share my testimony. And I am a husband. I'd tell you about my 25 years of marriage with Jill, and I am a dad, and I tell you about my amazing boys, and uh, let's see, I am a, a pastor, um, I'm a sports enthusiast, I've dealt with some anxiety stuff, it's been a big part of my story lately, um, I'm Pastor James Hero, like, I would just tell you things about me, and then you would go, oh, I'm getting to know this guy, right? That's what we're doing in this I Am series, and so today, um, appropriately, the I Am statement that we're looking at is found in John chapter 11, and it is this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Now, Jesus is about to do something in this family's life. The group of people that he says this to and the crowd watching, he's about to do something that's going to blow their minds. It's going to change the way they live. It's going to change their faith. It's going to change their future. It's going to change everything about their today. Like, it's crazy. He's about to blow their minds with what he does. You want to know what that is? No? All right, well, I won't tell you. We're going to read a different passage then. I was hoping you'd say yes, and I was going to make a little joke and say, tough, we're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to it. Here's what I want you to know. The reason we're going to come back to it is the only reason that these guys experienced absolute life change is because Jesus was alive and with them. That's why. And I, what I want you to understand today is, is that we can experience the exact same thing because he's still alive and still with us today. So what they experience, we can experience. And I want you to know he is still alive. Let's read Luke 24. 
On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. Somebody make some noise. Those three words would change the world. He has risen. That's why we're here today. Now, maybe some of you are like, come on, man. Why would I believe in that? Like, I'm a thinker. I'm an intellect. Like, I'm not just going, what, you expect me to believe some dude just came back to life and because it happened that long ago, I'm just supposed to buy it? Like, I'm smarter than that. Maybe that's you. Th that's how I thought for a long time, except for not the smart part. But it is. I was like, come on, man, no. But what happens more times than that is we put our faith in Jesus, and that's what a whole bunch of us have done. Um, but then life happens, doesn't it? And, and sometimes life happens, and you find yourself going, wait a minute. Is this thing real? Like, like I thought I felt something that one time, but like I've been praying, and I don't see anything change. And, and look at my life and look at my situation and like, look where I'm at. And this isn't supposed to happen. And it doesn't seem fair. And like, God, where are you? Like, and then sometimes when, when you, things aren't looking the way you want them to, we, we ask that question sometimes in our hearts and sometimes out loud. Like, is this thing real? I trust any of this. Or am I crazy for believing that some dude came back to life? Because that's what this whole thing's based on, right? I don't know about you, but I have felt that. And, and if that's you, I just want to say this. There's a book that has changed the game for me. Would you put that slide up? Uh, it's called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I highly encourage you, if you're like, man, I need some intellectual, factual, historical evidence to help me wrap my mind around Jesus being the Son of God and coming back from the grave, this is a great resource. And anyone who's in the publishing house for this book, I'd like my cut this week, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Get a hold of Kristen, she'll set it up. Um, I want to, I want to cover a passage though, as we get started today, um, that I think will really build your faith and help you get to the point where you go, it's not crazy for me to believe that he's still alive today. Although a man coming out of the grave sounds improbable, right? All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read first Corinthians 15, three through eight. Now here's what I want you to know before we read it. When Paul wrote this, he's writing a letter to some of his friends in Corinth. Paul doesn't know he's writing the Bible. He thinks he's writing a letter. God knew that he was gonna have this historical document put in his word. Paul didn't know, and the people who were reading it didn't know. And here's what we do know, and you can go look this stuff up yourself. Today we have thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of physical evidence showing that what we have in the, Old, in the New Testament today is the same thing that they had in the New Testament then. We have all these thousands and thousands of pieces of physical evidence guaranteeing the authenticity of that historical document matching what we're reading today. So what this passage is, it is, it is a document that we know existed in history, and it was passed around the first century church. In fact, what he talks about right here is why the first century church even got started. Here's what he says. For what I received, I passed on to you. He's like, guys, what I'm about to tell you, we've already been talking about. I've already told you this stuff, but it's so important, I gotta remind you. It's, in fact, it's of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he also appeared to me. Okay, you gotta, you gotta picture this. This is being handed to people who lived when this either happened or didn't happen. And historians believe that this was being talked about as early as a couple months after Jesus' death. We see this in Acts chapter two. This is exactly what Peter tells the crowd 50 days after the resurrection. He doesn't have three points and, and none of them rhyme and there's no funny story and a sad poem at the end. There's none of that. He has one thing he preaches about. 
you saw Jesus alive and you saw Jesus dead and you saw Jesus alive again. And everybody there went, I know, I can't believe it. It's crazy. And this passage is great because it, it says, I'm not just saying it. You don't have to take my word. Look at all the eyewitnesses. You can ask him. You can ask her. They were there. She was there. They were there. Over 500 people walking around going, I know it sounds crazy, but I saw it. Like, this is the kind of stuff that would hold up in any honest court in the world. Like, picture the court hearing for this. Your Honor, I'd like to uh, tell you why I believe the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ did happen. And the guy over there is rolling his eyes, and he goes, I'd like to bring in my first witness. Rick, if you don't mind. Rick has a seat. Rick, what do you do? I uh, work in finance. Okay, Rick. Rick, what'd you see? Uh, craziest thing. I'm walking into my office the other day with a couple clients. I couldn't believe it. Like I was there. I saw him. He was executed publicly. And there he is just walking through the parking lot. I couldn't believe it. We had to go see it for ourselves. It's crazy. I don't know what else to tell you. Like I'm a smart guy, but this happened. Thank you for your time, Rick. You're dismissed. <laughs> Janet, would you come on in and have a seat? Janet, Janet, what do you do? Oh, I'm uh Interior designer. Okay, Janet, what'd you see? Well, we were walking up to a house and, and there was Jesus and we couldn't believe it because my, my mom said she saw him, but I thought she was crazy. And then we saw him and it's a, I couldn't believe it because we know that he was dead. I was there when he got buried. I can't believe it. It happened. All right, Janet, thanks, Gary Smith. Uh, last, last, number three, James, would you come on up and uh, take the stand? James, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. Um, Okay, James, tell me your story. Oh, I was at the gym working out. James, were you doing legs? Of course not. I was doing chest and arms. <clears throat> okay, James, tell me your story. What was going on? Well, I was, in the, I was in the gym with my buddy Conrad, and you know we were getting pretty pumped up and flexing a little bit, talking to each other about how good we look. And then we went outside because we were next to the window. Our gym's over there on Emmaus Street, and, there's, and we saw Jesus walking by through the window talking to a couple guys. We ran out there. We were like, what's up? Is this real? And we talked to him. It's crazy, but it happened. And then he goes, let me bring in my 10th witness, 20th witness, 457th eyewitness. That's the kind of evidence that holds up in any courtroom in the world. Listen, here's what I love about, here's what I love about, about God. He didn't say, I want you to trust me. This is my son. And then we go, how come? Why would we trust you? And he didn't say, because I said so. He said, no, no, you can trust me because I did so. Christianity is not based off of a guy who says, I heard from God or I heard from an angel. Is there any proof? No, but you got to trust me. Christianity is based off an event that happened in history that had so much eyewitness testimony, it couldn't be refuted then. And it can't be refuted now. Jesus is alive. You can hold on to that. He's alive. He says, I'll stick closer than a brother. I won't leave you or forsake you. And I love this verse, Hebrews 13, 6 and 8. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to be afraid. Listen, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning, if he was willing to get in the middle of this family's messed up situation and do miracles and change their lives, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's alive and with us today, and he can get in the middle of our messy situations and do absolute miracles in our lives. That's what I want you to see. They had an alive and with them Jesus. We got an alive and with us Jesus. We can start to expect things to happen. All right, let's go back to that story. Since you were so curious. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. Some of you are like, wait a minute, I've heard of that guy. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. We would call that praying today when, when we ask Jesus to help us. She says, Jesus, we need your help. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Mm -mm. No, nah, this one's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? <laughs> I was reading this and I thought, I know that feeling. I know that feeling where I have very clearly described to God what he needs to do and in the time frame he needs to do it. And it doesn't happen. And I start to get discouraged. 
And I start to get frustrated. And I start to ask, is this thing even real? And sometimes I need to be reminded the same th thing they needed to be reminded, which is he's God, I'm not. And his timing's always perfect. And he's got reasons that I usually don't understand. But because I don't hear anything right away, because it doesn't work out in the time frame I think it should, doesn't mean my guy's not on the job. Jesus finally shows up. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. He's dead. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come. Here's what I love. See, remember the he's God, he's God we're not thing? Jesus, had he come in the time frame that the sisters wanted, nobody would have been there but Jesus and the sisters. But because he wanted what he's about to do to help a whole bunch more people go to heaven, he decided, I'm going to do this on my time, not yours, because I know if I wait a while, a whole crowd will gather around this thing. And I don't want just two of you to see this miracle. I want the whole city seeing this one. So his timing wasn't their timing. And, and so many times, isn't this true? We never understand those things till we get on the backside of it and we go, oh, that's why. I felt let down for a while and like you didn't have a plan, but oh my gosh, look what you did. Yeah. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. We read all that. Okay, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, you know what this feels like? If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I heard a promise that said you loved me. I heard you cared about me. I heard you have a plan for me. Well, we asked you for help. We begged you for help. We've never needed you more. And you know what you did? Nothing. One of the sisters doesn't even come out to greet him. She's like, what's the point now? He's dead. It's gone. It's over, Jesus. You could have helped, but you didn't. Come on, we're in church on Easter weekend. We got to be honest this weekend, don't we? You know what that feels like? God, I've been asking you to help us with this financial situation, and it doesn't seem to have changed. God, you, you see this relationship that's, that's breaking my heart, and, and it's, it's not changing. Like, you know the dream you put in my heart. How come I can't seem to get anywhere on it? You know the diagnosis. We're begging God. How come nothing's right? We, we know how that feels. See, what, what they thought was, because Jesus didn't do what they wanted in the time frame that they wanted, they assumed what we often assume, which is he must not care, he must not be listening, he must not have a plan, he must not be working in my situation. Couldn't have been farther from the truth. Jesus had never cared more about this family. Jesus had never had more plans for this family and their future. Jesus had never been working more things behind the scenes that they didn't understand. See, what we need to, what we need to be reminded is, is the whole resurrection, like it's so crazy. And what, what it always reminds me is like, he just does it in a way that I wouldn't do it. Same for you. And what we need to know sometimes is, yeah, I've been asking God to do something and I haven't felt like a whole lot of distance has been covered and it's not changing. And what I need to be reminded of and you need to be reminded of sometimes is, is he's always with us, even when we can't feel it. And he's always got a plan, even if you don't understand what it is. And he's always working behind the scenes, even if I can't see it. And the same is true for you, and the same is true for these sisters. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She said, yeah, I know. He'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You already told us about that. No, 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 no. I don't think you understand. I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live. I am the resurrection. I am the standing up. I am the rising up. I am the back to life. And because I am the resurrection, I can change your life in the here and now. I can change your life for all of eternity. Because I am the resurrection, there's nothing in your life I can't handle. I am the resurrection and the life. They wouldn't, they wouldn't think that meant a whole lot yet. But Lord, skip down to 39. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there's a bad odor. Like he's been in there four days. 
please don't ask us to roll this stone away. Please don't ask to look at the body. Like we want to remember our brother the way we saw him last. We know what happens to a body in these types of tombs in four days. We know how bad it's going to be decayed. We know what it's going to look like. We know what it's going to smell like. Please, Jesus, don't do that. You didn't do what you, you could have done and we don't get it, but it's too late. Jesus said, didn't, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. The greatest miracle this family would ever see. And here's what occurred to me as I was reading this. A bunch of you, you're like, I've been in church for a while. I heard that story. What's your point? Here's, a, my, here's my point. These girls, their prayer, their biggest request was to have a sick guy get well. Jesus said, I'll do you one better. I'll have a dead guy come back to life. Because see, I do things that are above and beyond what you could ask, think, or imagine. He's saying, girls, you're praying for something you've already seen me do. Why is that the height of your prayers? Why is all you ever pray for is what you've already seen me done? What if I want to do something in your life you've never seen before? And the only way you're going to see it is if you let me do it in my time. In my way, listen, everybody watching, this family, because Jesus didn't do it in their time, this family will never be the same. Their faith will never be the same. Anytime they have that moment of, oh my gosh, life gets hard, is this thing real? They're gonna look back and go, oh, it's real because I saw some stuff. Their faith is never gonna be the same. Their future is never gonna be the same. The purpose and calling on their life, it'll never be the same. Think about it. If he'd have healed a sick guy, we probably wouldn't have even heard the story. Like how many times in the Bible does it say they brought crowds to Jesus, he healed their sick, and then they left? And we don't hear any stories. But because he did more than what they were asking for, because he didn't just heal a sick guy, he raised a guy from the, from, back from the dead. 2,000 years after it happened, we're still getting blessed by what happened in their lives. Their life has more purpose and calling than they ever thought possible. And I think Jesus would say, hey, because I'm the resurrection and the life, you need to start expecting Ephesians 3.20, not just knowing it. Start expecting this in your life. Start expecting this in your family. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And church, I'm just telling you, I've seen it. If you've been a part of this church for a while, you've heard us talk about it. Fresh Life, I guarantee you've got so many stories in your church of God doing miracles. I've just seen it. Like, there's no financial miracle that God can't, there or situation that God can't do a miracle in. I've just seen it. Some of you, the few of you were here in our first year as a church. We had just hit about 75 people. We're like, bro, we're a mega church, man. We did it. We gave away our only, only all the money we had. It was 10,000 bucks. We gave it away to buy a missionary a van and the next week the fire marshal came into this little room in Heritage Square we started in the theme park fresh life it's a whole different deal we'll tell you later fire marshal came into the room and said that's not right and that's not right and that's not right and that's not up to code he said if you don't fix all this stuff I'm shutting you down you can't have church here anymore I said how much is this going to cost about 10,000 we're like thanks God I thought you said like this was your plan. I thought you said this was your church. I thought you cared. We thought you put it on our heart to give that money away. Now we can't have church. We're one day away from emailing the 75 people and going, sorry guys, like Red Rocks Church is shut down. We gave it our best. We're done. And I'm driving to the office and we're going to send that email out. And my phone rings. And it's a pastor that I hadn't talked to in years. It's Kevin. I said, what's up, Kevin? He said, Sean, I've been praying this morning. I said, Kevin, I'm really not in the mood. He said, Sean, God told me to give you some money. I said, tell me about your prayers, Kevin. <laughs> this sounds interesting. He said, bro, it's the weirdest thing. He goes, we haven't talked for so long. He goes, I was praying this morning, and God just told me I'm supposed to send you money. Do you need like eight, ten grand? Guys, I'm crying in the car. I'm going, wait a second. He's with me when I can't feel it. He's got a plan when I don't understand it. He's working behind the scenes when I can't feel it. And the same is true for you and whatever you're going through right now. There is no financial issue that our God can't take care of. I've watched him mend marriages and families and broken relationships in situations where you look at him and you go, that one doesn't have a chance. And I've seen him. I've sat with him and cried in my office across from that courtyard where people are going, we can't believe it, but we just love each other again. God did a miracle. 
I've seen him do miracles in, in people that suffer from mental illness. I talked to a guy standing right there last week. He came up and hugged me, and I didn't even recognize him because his eyes were like bright, and there was life and joy. And I went, oh my gosh, I didn't even recognize you because the last time I saw him, I was talking to him, and I was begging him not to take his own life. And he's like, man, you don't understand this anxiety and this depression. It's gotten so bad. It's so painful. I can't kick it. I've begged God. Nothing's changing. It's the only thing I can think of. I said, bro, your kids need you. Please don't do this. Bro, your wife needs you. Please don't do this. Like we prayed together. We believed together. And I'm, I'm hugging him down here last week. And he's going, you're not going to believe what God's done in my life. I can't wait to tell you. God does miracles. I've watched him heal people with physical illnesses. I stood out in that lobby this year and had an amazing lady show me a video of her riding a mountain bike on her phone a year after the doctor said this brain tumor can't be fixed. But see, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. There's nothing that I can't revive. There's nothing that I can't redeem. There's nothing that I can't bring back to life. I've, I've watched him save lives of people that you look at and go, not a chance does that one happen. No, uh-uh. I've just seen it. A couple months ago, I told you about a friend of mine named Cy, and the first time we met at church, I was thinking about him and his family this week because, and some of you know this story, but there's part of it I've never shared. I said, man, how, how's, your, how's your week been going? He's brand new to the church. He's like, well, man, I'm, uh, I grew up in gangs, and I've had a rough week. I'm like, what's up? He said, my, my best friend, was in a drug deal this week and he got shot multiple times in the chest and they put him in the trunk of his car and lit his car on fire and he burned to death. He's like, so I don't know if this God thing's like for me. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, I don't either. <laughs> I mean, it is, but I don't know if you're ever going to like want it. Cy ends up giving his life to God. Melissa gives her life to God. They're the, some of the first two people that got baptized at the church. Um, I, saw the, I saw this picture this week. Go ahead and put that. That is, that is their daughter getting baptized in 2019 who wasn't even born yet when Cy and Melissa gave their lives to God and got baptized. Listen to me. Cy came to the church going, God, if you're real, just get me through this week. And God goes, no, I do above and beyond what you could ever ask or imagine. I'm not going to get you through this week. I'm going to change your life. I'm going to change your family. I'm going to change your kids' lives who aren't even born yet. I'm going to give you a new family lineage. A guy who thought he couldn't, could, didn't have a chance and God wasn't for him and trying to make it through the week. And Melissa called Jill this week. She said, we're about to go on our, get this, 16th missions trip to Mexico to tell people how good our God is. Don't tell me God can't change anyone's life. Paul said this in Ephesians 1. The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. He said, I just want you to understand this, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe those who have put their faith in Jesus. And any of you who want to today, this is what you get according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, you get immeasurable greatness of power. He said that same power that brought Jesus up out of the grave. It's in you. You can do more than you think you can. You can get through things you never thought you could. You can conquer things you never thought you could. You can walk away from things you know you want to but didn't think you could. Put that slide up, would you? There's no financial problem he can't fix. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If I can conquer death, hell, and the grave, I can fix your financial issues. There's no relationship he can't restore. No dream he can't revive. No marriage he can't mend. No hurt he can't heal. No diagnosis he can't handle. No life he can't save through his amazing grace because of three words, he has risen. The church, we need that amazing grace. We need it so badly. Put that next slide up. God says, I want, you to, I want you to understand why I sent my son and why this grace is so amazing. He said, because every single one of you have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That's all of us. We've all just messed up. We've made mistakes. We just have. And God's perfect. And the two don't coexist. So he said, the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. But God said, I don't want that for any of my kids. So I give them the gift of my son. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
Yeah, but you don't know how bad my life's been. You think Sai's story's bad. You ought to hear mine. I'm a mess. You don't know the stuff I've been caught, caught up in. You don't know the habits I've went back to. You don't know what I've done this month, this week, last night. He says, no, no, no. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is for everybody. Yeah, but I'll, I'll never be able to earn it. I'll never, I'll never be able to deserve it. I know that feeling. I sat in a church at 24 years old, one week after contemplating suicide with cocaine in my pocket. And I heard a guy tell me I could have a different life. And all I could think about was I'll never be able to hold this standard. Like, look at these people. I can't be like these people. I can't even pretend. I just don't have what it takes. That's why God went out of his way to say, no, 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 no. It's for grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. He says it has nothing to do with what you've done and haven't done and has everything to do with what Jesus already did for every single one of us. I asked my wife in closing, I asked my wife, I said, babe, this is my 19th Easter. I'm running out of things to say about the resurrection. I said, what's the resurrection mean to you, babe? Because she's just, as you know, smarter than me. And she goes, um, she goes, without even hesitating, she goes, uh, Sean, read the last chapter of the Bible. That's what it's all about. And then she just walked off. Like throws down like truth grenade, then just, and I'm just like, All right. So I went and read the last chapter of the Bible a few times. And I challenge you to do the same because it is what the whole thing's about. God talks to us about heaven and how real it is. That when we put our faith in Jesus, we get to be there forever and we'll be face to face with him, he says. He says he has this unbelievable grace, but only if we accept what Jesus has for us. Here's the last two verses of the Bible. I'm about to read. Don't put them up yet. Here's the last two verses of the Bible, the whole thing. And you know this, like those of you who have kids, when you're talking to your kids and you're about to leave, the last thing you say is most important, right? Like when me and Jill leave and we're talking to Ethan and she'll be like, babe, you got some clean socks in a basket over there. She doesn't talk like that, but it's more fun for me. She's got clean socks in a basket over there and I got you some Lunchables and we got all the things. And then I'm like, oh, that's cute, Ethan, come here. No parties, don't burn my house down, keep your brother alive. The dog's optional. Like the last thing you say, right? The last thing God says in his entire word for us. Listen to this. He who testifies to all these things says it again. I'm on my way. I'll be there soon. Yes, come Master Jesus. The grace of the Master Jesus be with all of you. Oh yes, or some translations say, amen, let it be. Three times in that chapter, he says, please get ready because I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Don't miss out on my grace. It'll change your in the here and now, but it'll change your eternity. I'm coming back. I want you with me forever in heaven. Don't miss out on my grace. And then he says, now it's your choice. You get to choose. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for Easter. I thank you for everything you've done for us that we never earned, never deserved, can't earn on our best day. I thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we haven't earned. And God, I pray for those right now who have already put their faith in you, but they've been walking through life carrying all kinds of shame and guilt and I pray that you would set them free from that in Jesus' name. In fact, everybody look up here real quick. Sorry, Fresh Life, I do this from time to time. You know you're not supposed to interrupt prayers. I was reading this week, in fact, I, was, I was talking to Corey, and then I started reading about it. There's this, there's this verse in the Bible that calls Satan the accuser. And, and I started reading about it this week, and it says the accuser, and he wants to, he said that's who Satan is, and he wants to remind you of your sins day and night. It's like God gives us the resurrection and he goes, it's not, a, it's not something you just gotta trust me on. It's an event in history. You know it happened. And you got the accuser over here going, you can't take that. You'll never be good enough. 
Remember what you've done. Remember what you've done. Remember who you are. Who are you kidding? And then if you put your faith in that, the accuser keeps going. And he goes, don't you dare enjoy this thing. Don't you dare think God likes you right now. Don't you dare think he's not sick and tired of you right now because he is. Look what you've been doing. And then on the other side, you got Jesus going, I am the resurrection and the life, and I'll take care of every single sin, every single mistake. You are free. You are perfect in God's sight. And we stand in the middle, and that too is our decision. Who do I listen to? Do I listen to the accuser and keep carrying this guilt? Or do I listen to my creator and walk in this freedom? Prayer part two. God, thank you so much that we don't have to listen to the lies of the enemy. We can walk in freedom because of you. With everyone's head bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna ask two questions. I just wanna give you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life today. The first question is this. You've already given your life to God. But the truth is, you know I need his power. I'm already saved. I'm already a Christian. But I need his power because we're going through some stuff right now. And I need to be reminded I have that power within me. And I need to experience it right now. If that's you, raise your hand. And I'm going to say a prayer for you and your family. Yeah, a whole bunch of us. Okay, the second question is this. I've been up here talking but the truth is God's been speaking to your heart and you know it. You know without a shadow of a doubt, like this is it. I don't know how this is gonna go. I'm not even close to perfect, but I need to ask him to forgive me of my sins. I need to say yes to Jesus because when he comes back, I wanna be ready. I wanna have his spirit in me so I can get through things I never thought I could get through. And most importantly, I want the ultimate prize. I want heaven forever. And so today on Easter weekend, I say yes to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand. You say yes to Jesus today. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your love. I accept your life. Thank you. Yes, yes, I see you. I see you. I see you. Yes. Yes, praise God. God, I thank you for what you're doing right now, literally around the world. I thank you for your son. I thank you for salvation. For those who just made this life-changing, eternity-changing decision, I pray that they would sense your presence like never before. And God, for everyone who just raised their hand and said, I need to experience your power, that means they're going through some stuff. God, would you remind every single one of them, you are with them, you are working, you have a plan, and with you, nothing is impossible. And I pray that they would start to experience your peace, that weights would come off their shoulders knowing the God of the universe is on the job, and I can trust that in Jesus' name.